Well, joining us in the studio this morning to talk about the biggest business news stories of 2014, Chris Bishop, he's managing editor of Forbes Africa and independent analyst who is uh, also the uh, chief economist at the Institute of Race Relations, Ian Cruikshanks. Ian, let's start with this Russian story before we get on to come of the big stories in South Africa, the platinum strike and African Bank in particular, and the oil price we've got to talk about. But this Russian story, uh, it, it looks like free fall for the currency and uh, devastation potentially for the uh, Russian economy. Absolutely. And what it's proving is that sanctions do work, economic sanctions against Russia. And certainly it just has to go on a little bit longer and surely they must feel forced to change their, their view and their attitude towards Ukraine. They can't go on just seeing their currency destroyed by the economy being destroyed. Uh, I, I think that it's got to lead to major changes. What's the effect going to be on emerging markets generally because they always catch colds from sure. one emerging market and us? The risk that we can see a, a move of uh, investment capital to so-called safe havens, i.e. dollar-denominated areas, and I think that that could mean that we could see a further outflow of foreign portfolio flows from South Africa into those safe havens. Chris, what have you taken away from the story? One thing that comes to mind is uh, this interest rate hike was effective from yesterday. So if you had a bond 10.5% on Monday, come Tuesday at 17%. Well, um, I think the worrying thing for me is that it's the R in BRICS, the connections with uh, this neck of the woods. I mean, you look the other day, we were reading about the Gazprom looking to invest in oil and gas here, which is a big story in sub-Saharan Africa. And it makes you wonder now what the ramifications are. Are we going to see a drying up, a loss of interest as Russia tries to deal with its with its home. I mean, I was reading a quote this morning from the Reserve Bank saying it's a nightmare, you know. I mean, I think when you get to this point, it's got to be a worry. Of course, Ian, remember when our interest rates went up to the mid-20s in yeah. the late... It seems inconceivable now <laughs> because they're keeping them steady for so long. But our interest rate was around 25%. Uh, people were battling to pay their bonds. It just shows... I mean, that's not a crisis like Russia's experience, but it just shows a few percentage points and uh, individuals and companies are, can be in big trouble. It brought the housing market to a halt. It meant consumer spending just dried up. Uh, a large portion of the whole economy, over 60% of the economy, is consumer spending. It just meant that that didn't happen, or to a very limited extent. So yes, a very serious impact is the potential threat. All right, well, let's go uh, on to our local scene. And I think, gentlemen and lady, the, 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 the issue that hasn't been talked about much in the last couple of months, but we spent the whole first six months of the year talking about was that platinum strike. Mm -hmm. And it went on, we, we thought it would last a, a month or two, and it went on for five months. And the name jo Joseph Matunjwa, who was the AMCU leader, they announced a strike fund to assist striking workers uh, as that strike went on. And we had an interesting uh, interview with uh, Joseph. Uh, Open Exchange spoke to him, the AMCU president, and he ended up doing some uh, fundraising on our program. The account number is 3327 Six three four, and the branch code is O five two seven five zero, and the name of the bank is Standard Bank. Have then, you have you attracted any funds so far, Joseph? Indeed, I mean we presented a one million check yesterday. And subsequent to that, the national office bearers and the staff of AMCO has contributed 50,000 uh, in cash towards uh, this fund. And uh, I hope after my interview with you, you will also put in some donation towards that fund. Yeah. But Joseph, for David Williams here, you've got, uh, you mentioned 50,000, 100,000, perhaps a million. You've got uh, tens of thousands of workers on strike. This is not going to go very far to help them. Are you getting pressure from your members that they've now been without uh, pay for something like 10 weeks and they need the money? Okay, I'll answer this one. It's just I want to be clear how many people are posing questions are interviewing me. I've got two people now. I just want to focus it's, myself. It's that both of us at the desk, Joseph. Come again? It's two people at the desk. Oh, so. I didn't know that. I didn't know. No, it's fine. I don't have a problem with it. Right. Yes, we don't have any pressure from anyone. 
Oh, some uh, interesting comments coming from them. You were yeah, part of that interview. I tempted to, you know, seeing you, I was being interviewed by him, uh, or rather interviewing him, that I should contribute, you know. <laughs> it just came out like that. I think, didn't he say that he's actually looking forward to the Open Exchange team he said, contributing? He said that. he would appreciate a donation. <laughs> <laughs> but Chris, you have been very familiar with what has been playing out in uh, the Platinum Strike, strikes no, not just this year, but over the past couple of decades or so. What did you take away from this? Well, uh, put it into context I mean in the days when precious metals mines went on strike for one maybe two days it used to be chaos everyone would be running around like headless chickens this is the end of the world we had five months mm. of as you say more than about half of the world's platinum output was paralyzed by the leadership of one man and one thing that struck me we were talking about it before the program is the fact that this guy survived those five months. You imagine the amount of unrest, people who wanted to go back to work, people who were trying to smear him as it were. Uh, he had pressure from all sides and he survived that time and he kept them all together right until the day they went back to work and now he's disappeared almost and I'm sure next year, 2015, we're going to hear a lot more from him I think. Jimmy mentioned a couple of decades, I mean if you go back 20 years this was probably the most significant year in terms of labour relations in South Africa and probably way be before that uh, if you think of the old trade union organisations under apartheid, coherent National Union of Mine Workers was the union. For the first time Ian we had, it's not clear who represents the workers and a new force. Yes, and the, one's also got to consider the political ramifications of this as well because the mining unions have brought considerable power uh, to the political parties and I think that there's a risk there that that could, uh, could, could be disintegrated to some extent as well. So very broad uh, thing. But what is interesting, just looking at these miners demonstrating, you know, apparently with no pay, but they all look pretty well fed. You know, uh, how do they manage? I don't know, but it just shows their determination to find a way to better rewards. And one other thing which is worthy of mention, I think, on this, which happened in 2014, for years, the employers have been playing AMCO off against the National Union of Mine Workers to try to loosen the grip of the NUM. And now all of a sudden you've got this monster, uh, AMCO, that's come up with this massive support and seems solid and seems not to care. If you think about the amount of fighting and struggling that the NUM did in past years for half a percent, one percent, and what we're talking about, 20%, in some cases 15% increases. It, it's well, it's a game pivotal. changer, that strike. Changed the environment. Interesting to see how the government reacts to this going down. They, they're not used to not having a compliant uh, trade union organisation. Well, another big story of the year was African Bank, of course. And I recall around right about this time last year, Leon Kirkinus was defending the bank and the way he was doing things. Then there were some surprises for investors in the early part of the year. And uh, Bruce Whitfield interviewed uh, Leon Kirkinus towards the end of that uh, scenario, uh, talking to him about how African Bank was uh, behaving, of course, before the collapse. Uh, there will always be a need for our services in this market by customers. We don't chop and change. We don't come in and go out uh, at a whim. We hear consistently, yes, it's a tough environment. And as you say, it's going to remain a very tough environment in the period ahead of us. Um, but at the same time, that's exactly when you should start to understand what's happening to your customers. Well, this definitely made headlines, Ian. This yes. had changed uh, the banking landscape, but a lot of people com uh, commended the Reserve Bank for stepping in when they did. What did you yes. make of the story? What would be interesting to see is they're going to split the assets between a good bank and the bad assets. Well, nobody's going to want those other assets. The Reserve Bank may have to wait a long time to get that capital back. But the good bank, supposedly looking for a listing in February, I'm not so sure they're going to do that. And where are the willing investors going to come who prepare to take that sort of uh, that sort of risk again. Yes, different leadership. Tom Winterboer is certainly known to be very cautious, very conservative, which is a very different view from the way it was managed in the past. But uh, I think what it just says is that uh, the, the days of unsecured lending are probably past tense. Well, they all, Kirkinus used to say there's a market there and they need us. Yeah, and nice. African Bank is still trading and it's yeah. still collecting its debts. The listing of the so-called good bank has now been delayed. Chris, uh, Forbes tends to focus on business personalities. Mm -hmm. And Leon Kirkinus is one of those larger-than-life people. It's an interesting question. To what extent was African Bank Leon Kirkinus and his mm -hmm. credibility? And then when he overreached himself, perhaps they lost more credibility than they deserved to. Well, I think individuals uh, like him, I mean, the original Forbes ethos was that people who run businesses are a lot more interesting than the businesses they run. I think he's a case, he is a character, certainly. But the one thing that was sad for me about this African Bank story is that 
You look at the trials and tribulations it had been through like 30, 40 years ago. It, was it not, didn't it take them 10 years to raise 1 million yeah. to actually make it as a bank in the first place? Two, we interviewed in Forbes Africa one of their first customers, this guy up in Polokwane. He had his house burned down in the troubles in the old days. No one would lend him money. So he went, they saw this new bank on the high street, African bank, went in there, knocked on the door. They gave him 60,000 rand, which was a, a fortune in those days to rebuild his house. So. To me, you know, a lot of people down the years have had this emotional attachment to it. And I, I just felt it really sad that after all these years, it was being uh, sort of tossed around in the headlines. No, but as Toomey said at the beginning, uh, the Reserve Bank has acted well. And mm -hmm. again, our regulation of the sector handled a difficult situation uh, well. Uh, Another yes. difficult situation that had to be dealt with, and we seem to have more and more of this at boardroom level. One example, perhaps an extreme example of boardroom turbulence was uh, PPC. Uh, we spoke to Executive Chairman Becky Sabir. That was uh, when the company's uh, African expansion strategy was linked with the former CEO, Ketso Gordon, and whether it depended on that former CEO. If you look at Africa growth strategy, it was adopted by this board. And, uh, uh, Keto, or the former CEO, came and found the strategy there, adopted it and executed it. Uh, it would not have been taken by a non-functional board. And for us, not only did we come with a strategy, we went into Ethiopia, we went into DRC, we went to Rwanda, we were exploring Algeria because we were taking decisions which were fine. I think the allegations were opportunistic and in my view were extremely unfortunate. Ian, it was a fascinating story. Yes. Ketso Gordon resigned. He asked them if he could resign it. They said, no, you've resigned. Goodbye. And Becky Sabir seems to have engineered something that suits the old board more than the shareholders who rebelled. Well, if it brings stability to the investment situation, that should suit everybody, including all of the shareholders. So I think that, that, is, that that's a positive move there. Um, I think that uh, uh, Ketso Gordon seemed to be a disruptive influence post his attempt to get his job back again. And perhaps we need uh, to put that aside and carry on with the business of doing the business of making cement. Well, the share price certainly didn't go up when it was uh, made clear that he would not be returning. So maybe that's one way of uh, judging it. Mm. Unprecedented, wouldn't you say? Well, uh, the one thing about this that uh, is that interests me, how many boardroom battles there are these days. And yet, going back to African Bank, how many crazy decisions just go through on the nod, no one says anything. How if they much think was it's going through that we didn't know about before? It, now exactly. I mean, even look at the financing furniture through LREs. I mean, if you look at that, a lot of people just said, no, no, it's not a good idea. Yeah, yeah. And yet, everyone nodded, thought it would take money, thought it would make money. And that sometimes worries me. I mean, you've got millions and millions of dollars that are thrown away every year yeah. by boards who think, well, OK, this guy obviously knows what he's talking about, let him go. <laughs> Well, gentlemen, it certainly has been a fascinating year. Only uh, can hope to wonder what 2015 brings. Thanks to our guest, that's Chris Bishop, the managing editor of Forbes Africa and independent analyst Ian Crookshanks.